all my siblings came back later. I didn't. And they all speak Andalusian. <laughs> oh, Everybody okay. in my family speaks Andalusian. And I but, speak but, Castilian. <laughs> but you speak Castellano, so you speak the quote-unquote proper Spanish. All right. Muy bien, muy bien. Oh. Muy bien, muy bien. Uh, buenas, tar <laughs> buenas tardes, guten Abend, good afternoon, good morning, wherever in the world you are. This is the Culture Talk, live from Madrid, Spain, via Atlanta, Georgia. We're connecting the south of the United States with the south of Europe, and we're working from home with... Emmy Golding and Peter Diaz, hello. Thanks for being available for Hi. us. And um, thanks for having us. Well, it's a pleasure. Let, let, let me do some introductions here. Um, those of you who know what I do and who read newsletters and social media and, and come on to this um, live session, you may have not met Emmy and Peter yet because they haven't been, let's say, visible much in, in my network. However, they became very much visible in the last week or well, 10 days or so when um, Emmy and Peter asked me to contribute a piece to their special magazine issue, um, special around coronavirus COVID-19 crisis. So without further ado, I'm going to let you do the introductions because I'm just going to butcher it anyway. So all I know is we have one bloody Aussie here, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. <laughs> and we have um, another semi Aussie who's, but I guess Spanish, Spanish, <laughs> Spanish, Spanish <laughs> something <laughs> too. Spanish, Germanic Aussie. <laughs> All right. So, Emmy, Peter, wh why don't you take it away and explain to our lovely audience who you well, are and what brings you here and why you're in Madrid of all places? Well, first thing I have to say to your lovely audience is that your article on culture for a special edition of the coronavirus magazine or the EMAC was brilliant. It was Thank full you. of insights and I loved it. So I think people should just grab it and read it because I think it's full of insights. Thank you. Um, Emmy and myself, we're the, we're the founders of the Workplace Mental Health Institute. Um, we founded that about 10 years ago um, in, in a different, it's evolved over the years, but that's where we started. And um, I fulfilled the role of the CEO for the organization and Emmy is the director of psychology, being a psychologist. So that's our role. And um, we are in Spain with a view, we are expanding. We are, we are expanding into the UK and uh, also to the US and uh, also some other countries in Europe. So we were here to test the waters. And we were about to run a couple of workshops, one in <laughs> New York City in July, which might that have might to be still delayed. Happen? No, maybe it <laughs> may still happen. Ah. May still happen. <laughs> it's already all booked. Um, so, and there was another one in April in London, which I don't think we're going to make it. We're going to have to postpone that. Mm -hmm. But they were all both planned and uh, more were in the woodworks. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, why Madrid? We've got a little one, about six years old. And uh, we're both interested in him learning Castilian, Spanish, with the Castellano accent. And we said, we have to stay somewhere. Why not make him Madrid? And right. that way he can learn. And that's why, why we're in Madrid very short trips everywhere compared to Australia. In Australia, because we, the, the organization doesn't depend on us delivering the courses because we've got facilitators in uh, everywhere. six countries now. Yes, something like that. Uh, yeah. Including China and Japan. And um, so it doesn't depend on us. So what we do is we drive the organization, we provide the promotion. And that's when we put to, we thought about the coronavirus special edition. I right. ask you. Yeah. So... T t tell me a little bit more about, I mean, I, I obviously know a little bit, but our audience may, may not know this yet. So the Workplace Mental Health Institute, which was founded in Sydney, Australia, um, wh yeah. what is the main purpose of it? Well, what, what do clients come to you for? What do they trust you with when you do your work? Sure. Well, well, I guess a, a bit of background as to how it started was we both worked in the mental health industry as a psychologist and as a clinical social worker. And, you know, we're very well educated on how to support people with mental health issues. Um, one of the things we noticed in the organization we were working with and, and many other similar ones was that while we're very good at supporting our clients, oftentimes 
uh, we weren't really supporting our staff as best we could. And they mm. too experience, you know, stress, anxiety, all the things that human beings do. And so that kind of got us thinking to, well, I'm sure there's plenty of workplaces out there with similar challenges and we found at the Institute. So we go out there and train particularly managers. That's our focus because we find that managers are in key roles to make a difference. Mm-hmm. So we go out there and um, upskill them on how to uh, have conversations about well-being, how to create environments that are supportive of people so that they can be happy and perform at their best in the workplace. Nice. So we cover sort of every part of the continuum from, you know, when someone's really struggling, how do you have that conversation about mental ill health to how do you keep everybody staying well and healthy and resilient and facing, you know, the everyday challenges that come up in life. And those everyday challenges have become different now all of a sudden, right? So yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the managers are not necessarily going back to their offices anytime soon. And sure, there's a conference you got mm-hmm. planned or an event you got planned for, what was it, June in the US? And um, if we believe um, North American political leadership, it'll all be over by Easter, right? So, um, so I'm counting on you being here. I mean, I, I don't want to make fun of this. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't know what, don't want to take this lightly, especially given the fact that you currently reside in a country that has been devastated yeah. by by this crisis, and and Absolutely. it's 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 been it's been just sad seeing and watching the news every day. So, how does yeah. this affect the work that you do? Not only um, in the service delivery to professionals who are now facing different challenges of being well, in a good mental space at work because they're not going to the same place of work. And also kind of a a double dip on that question, how is it affecting you as you're delivering your work because you're working from home just like most everybody else is? So tell us how how that's changing the way you operate. Well, with with us about six years ago, six, seven years ago, we decided we, we needed expert uh, mentoring and, and coaching and learning from the best around the world. So very early on, about six, seven years ago, we got used to using Zoom technology, Skype, whatever. I think at the time was Skype and then Zoom came on board. But we got used to seeing people on the screen and considering this face-to-face. So we gradually started training all our facilitators to be able to do this, to be able mm-hmm. to do sessions, to be able to do webinars, to be able to do Zoom. So for us, this change hasn't technologically hasn't shaken us because we're used to it. Mm-hmm. And by me, I mean our whole team is used to it by now. So in that sense, it's has been good. But to be honest, if I remember back to when we started, it wasn't that easy. It, it, it really took a psychological shift to be able to look at a screen and say, yeah, I am talking to Christian. That is mm-hmm. Christian. I can see Christian. And the first and I'm on camera. And, I'm on camera and, that's <laughs> and okay. people are watching this. Yes. <laughs> and, oh my God. and they're going to be judging me. <laughs> and it was a psychological shift. So I, I really empathize with what people are going through now. If working from mm-hmm. home, um, you need to think about things like, is my hair okay? In my case, it doesn't matter. But um, it used you, did a, to you did a great um, job, though. You, whoever did your makeup up there, excellent job. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I was I was fishing for compliments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, successfully. Uh, but but yeah, it, 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 there's little things that uh, now have become second nature for us. And uh, when you start, are uh, can be a little bit stressful. Mm. Can can unsettle you a bit. Um, doing a training which is come second nature now online or even even participating as part of a training online uh, we we can see for some people it's a challenge it is Mm -hmm. a challenge it is part of these stresses and then uh, they have little ones at home which may come around the corner any seconds and they have to train them with mommy or daddy on on this kind of technology this is a meeting. You don't come in, <laughs> and they will test the waters. They will. They always come in for the first few times to just yep. make sure that you are for real. So th- I can see that the levels yeah. of, of of stress uh, yeah. of some people having, have gone up. Having said that, a lot of the corporations that we work with do have teams. I mean, we work with mediums to large size and multinational corporations. So oftentimes they do have people in faraway places, in remote areas, 
And so they are perhaps more familiar with logging in through an online portal than some of the other organisations. So what I'm finding in the conversations that we're having in the past few weeks is that different organisations are in very different places when it comes to this in terms of what they've got set up, what their regular habits and practices have been to date. Uh, so. I don't know. I think it was one one of these calls that I had in in, in recent weeks. Somebody um, introduced what they call the um, the traffic light system. So they do the green light, uh, yellow light, red light system for the little ones in the house. So they're, they they have found like cardboard stickers that they place outside their uh, their <laughs> office door, the, the the workspace, so the kids know that if there's red light, there is um, only if the dog bit off your 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 um, pinky toe, <laughs> then and, and you're bleeding gallons, then you might disturb your your parent. If if it's yellow, it has to be a, a minor disruption that would justify disturbing mommy or daddy at, at work and green um i think i got that confused um red is no dis disruption you get the idea yeah, you get the idea so so however you want to define yeah. it for yourself so the, must be a german cool. household no. <laughs> actually that was that's somebody, very organized that was for somebody from the united states and um oh, uh, right. even though even though we might be german um my wife will tell you that. So, since she's married me, the, the German organization has gone, fallen to the sidelines because I'm, I'm not as organized and structured and cleanly as a, a German household would expect. But uh, enough of that. I'm, we're good at sharing all, all, all the negative parts. By the way, my, 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 my hair and makeup was immaculate today. So, um, Very good, yes. <laughs> how ch checking in with with you and your community um how how has it been for you in these past two weeks in madrid i mean madrid is one of the epicenters uh, of, of corona outbreak mm. how is this yeah. how does it feel oh look um you can feel christian the collective pain yeah it, it hangs in the air there's um People are not necessarily being violent with each other, that are not being curt or, uh, or brush, but the, just the wearing of masks, um, because uh, Spaniards are so expressive. I mean, if you li see little kids, they speak <laughs> with their face, and yeah. they gesticulate with their face, and now they have a mask covering their whole face, Yes. And you can see how the level of communication has mm. dropped. People are, are not talking to each other. And they're not even making eye contact in yeah, the beginning. Yes, yeah. It's almost like you're embarrassed to see people because you have lost that ability to communicate the expressions of your face. Right. So psychologically, it's an, it, because we are always observing people because that's what we do. Um, mm. and, and the impact, you can, you can tell people are suffering. Um, mm. People are... Uh, and and it, it's interesting, now we've reached day 18, isn't it? Day 18 of a full lockdown. We're not talking about lockdown like in other countries where they can go for a walk. You're not supposed to go for walks here. Um, oh, wow. Kids do not come out, they stay at home. Uh, this is a full lockdown, very serious. And um, so, But it's had stages. I mean, we went from pretty much life as normal. We we're aware that there was some stuff going on, but very quickly we went from... Overnight. It was Monday in the evening, about 8 p.m. They announced schools are going to close Wednesday. So you've got one more day and then that's it, schools close. Uh, so we hustled to organize arrangements uh, for that. And then by Friday, they said, that's it. All businesses must close now if you can, but definitely today's the last day of trading, close up. And I remember we were going out looking for somewhere to have dinner and everything was shut. We couldn't get dinner. And we said, all right, well, we better go and buy some groceries and, and we'll cook at home. Um, so we did that. And then Saturday, the following day, they announced complete lockdown starting Sunday. So it was very, very quick. And so there was this sudden shock that we went from life as normal where everybody's out, everybody's traveling and everyone here travels by metro. Um, and, and they, they're having their coffee and their tapas and on the street and it was very busy to so suddenly it's, it's quiet. Nothing. It's, the quietness is you can't hear the kids playing outside. You can't hear anything. It's very, very quiet, which is kind of weird. Very it's so surreal. Yeah. So yeah. If, if it's, if it's a complete lockdown, um, 
how you how you're getting your your groceries is that still allowed to go out for those you're, you're allowed you're allowed to go to the groceries you're allowed to go to the chemist and to the doctor mm-hmm. and even the tobacconist <laughs> which i find oh. very funny you, the tobacconist they're allowed to be open and the news agent so you can get that but but okay. um nothing else is open um so- the tobacco even shop the is open, are, if, if, even though every doctor will tell you if, if now will be probably the best yeah. time to stop smoking, right? With, with that. I don't, yeah, I don't think they want people going through withdrawals right now on top of everything oh, else. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a matter of public safety. Yes. Um, so that mean, <laughs> means they still can get their wine, right? Yeah. Not just, not just yes. Well, you market. can get wine at the supermarket here, so that's, right, right, you can get right. wine everywhere. That's that's not a problem. It doesn't even count as alcohol here. It's no, wine no, and it's... beer. That that's not that's not alcohol. That's just beer and wine. You know. It's yes. the culture <laughs> aspect of it. Like yeah, people right. tell us they don't drink only wine and beer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So f- for those of you in the United States or in in other areas of the world who are watching this, and your country may have gone through prohibition times where alcohol has been demonized and that mindset is still lingering on people from europe see that as part of the nutritional basket um and if you're in uh in the iberian peninsula or if you're in italy or greece or even france i would say wine is a a victual it's a necessity of your daily consumption in moderate amounts (laughs) um so there you go now um it tends to be with food it tends to be when eating Exactly. They drink uh, and with wine breakfast. Or beer. And not a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, <yeah. laughs> but we have seen, because we had an initial four, uh, 14 day lockdown, it was going to be two weeks. And so everybody kind of got on board with that. Um, they're very uh, compliant and agreeable to, okay, we're going to do that. And right. then after it was announced that this is being extended another two weeks, we definitely saw a change then. So you've seen more people going shopping. Mm-hmm. Um, in the last day or two, um, we've These seen... These last two days, there's more people, about yeah. four times more people than the, in the last week. So I think, I think people are starting to get restless. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And they're starting to communicate more with each other as well um, in terms of... Two things happened. We had that extension. And so I think people went, well, I'm tired of not seeing people. I'm going to make an extra effort to say hello if I do see someone, mm-hmm. um, you know, passing and in the we've been we've been running up and down i don't know if we're allowed to are we allowed to we've been running up and down the stairs in our building for some exercise so we haven't left huh. the premises but mm-hmm. you know occasionally you do see someone we're the, only ones, though. We're the only ones doing it but you might see someone um open their door to water their plants or something and they're, now they're saying hello um but the other thing that happened is daylight savings Right. So when everybody goes out in the evening on their balconies to applaud the medical services, um, we can actually see each other's faces now, whereas yeah, before right. it was dark. And yeah. so we just had lights and torches we were shining around. Now you can actually see faces and communicate. Right. So which which um, kind of helped. for those of you who have never been to Europe during the summer, it's, it's very interesting with daylight savings time in Europe. It, it, it applies to almost all of the European Union. I think Portugal is still an hour, uh, an hour closer to the United States or to North America, but Spain, from Spain to Poland, uh, Europe is on in the same time zone. However, Spain is a four hour flight from Poland and they're still in the same time. So it, it's interesting how, how your mornings and evenings look different um, in Spain than they would, or in Madrid than they would in Warsaw or in, in Belgrade, right? So um, mm. one, one aspect that I would like to hear from you, because P- Peter, you speak Castellano, you speak Spanish fluently. Um, Emmy, I don't know, how, how is your Spanish? Mm. It's coming along nicely. Entiendo más que puedo hablar. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I understand more than I can speak. Yeah, that's, that's I understand more level. than I can speak. So I'm getting... <laughs> yeah. Now, now the reason don't ask me to asking, do con- conjugate verbs and stuff. <laughs> who, who, who needs that anyway? Um, now, <laughs> the reason why I'm asking this, and 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 in our work, we work a lot with expatriates, and I've I've done several virtual expatriate cultural trainings in the last couple of weeks. I mean, let's face it, we've been doing this work just like you. We've been doing virtual 
training and coaching for years. So this is not new to us. The technology is familiar yeah. with, to us and, and, and the formatting is, is familiar to us. It's the clients that are now recognizing, oh, we used to look at this as a semi-good option if we can't have face-to-face -face classroom style, but we'd yeah. rather have you come in to work with a client face-to-face. -face. And I kept telling them, well, mm. this is face-to-face -face as well. Don't we see each other? Um, so now the, yeah. mar the market is now beginning to understand, okay, this is the only thing we can do right now. So they're recognizing the validity of virtual delivery, which we've been mm. um, we've been singing that song for years and now out of necessity, um, which is I think the mother of invention or something like that, um, clients mm -hmm. are, or the market is now beginning to realize, okay, this works as well. So, but what I was trying to say is in, in the last couple of weeks, I've been doing um, several of these expatriate cultural trainings and the energy is different because now I'm talking to an expat who has just recently been moved abroad, whether it is here to the US or over to another location, wherever in the world they are. And the energy is completely different because now they thought they would be going to work, they would be making new connections in their new destination, they would learn to speak the language better, they would explore that culture in in that corner of the world that they are assigned to and that isn't happening that same way so i'm wondering mm -hmm. how is it for you i mean you you grew up in australia now you're yeah now you find yourself in in the birth culture of your husband's world so to say <laughs> and yeah, yeah. How, how, how does that feel being there and then maybe not being there fully how, how how's that experience for you? yeah yeah well i guess i do have some i am lucky in a lot of ways because i have been here quite a few times over the past 10 or more years so i've already gone through some of the learnings about the culture and a little bit of learning about the language but but i've kind of already broken some barriers in terms of i now know what are some of the things you know what you can find in the shops here, what you can't, where you go for things, like just those little things that can make such a difference when you first arrive in a new country. And gosh, I remember trying to find Blue Tack the first one of the early times we came here. I couldn't what is find Blue it Tech? anywhere. You know, you know Blue Tack? Blue Tack's the stuff that you it's blue and it's like a tacky gum that you kind of use to stick paper on walls. Oh um, okay. just paper. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah no, but no, it's no, actually no, the okay. brand name. Yeah. And, and you normally find it in, in the supermarket or in a paper shop, a news agent, something like that. It was in the hardware store. So it's like, oh, it took three days to try and figure out where I could get this thing. And no one knew what I was talking about because it must be very particular. Eventually was it right I found next, it. Now I know. So now, was it right next to the jar of Vegemite? No, no, it wasn't. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I brought that with me. <laughs> of course, as, as, as a good Aussie would. See? Yeah. So now I know what I need to bring when I come to Spain and vice versa. When I go back home, I know what I want to bring from here that I want to take mm. there. So I've learned. So that really helps. But um, I guess as uh, being here in this situation right now, I guess it just increases the level of uncertainty. Obviously, there's already enough uncertainty going on as well. But, you know, there's things like, all right, well, hypothetically, let me prepare for worst case scenario. Um, if I did get sick, for example, and the, you know, the hospital system is stretched and they need to decide who to provide resources to. I'd expect they're gonna provide it to their own citizens before anyone else. So that's sort of something that sort of just lingers in the back of your mind. And then is, we have the decision, is, is, should we? Hang on, I, 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 wanna, I wanna interject on that, sorry. Is, is that a real, yeah. a real fear? Is that a, a legitimate concern? I don't or know. Have, have you learned by now that? Um, since you're a legal resident of, of Spain, that you will be treated or will be provided with the same level of care as anyone else would? I, I haven't looked into the legalities around it or anything like that. But I, I guess from, a, from an emotional perspective, it's just that little thought that you have yeah. in the back of your mind that you go, oh, mm. even if technically they're meant to, would that actually happen in practice? I don't mm. know. I know last year, I, I was here for a little while last year as well, and I had um, actually got pneumonia. And I was in hospital here for a couple of weeks. 
and the the medical system is fantastic here. That's world class. It's it's actually really good. So I don't mm-hmm. I don't know what's going on right now, but um, it, it, it I got fantastic treatment. Um, and and it was wonderful. I don't know what the situation would be right now. And 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 as I said, I haven't really looked into it, but it's just one of those uncertainties that I'm sure many of people who are not in their home native country might be thinking yes. about. Yes. And then there's the decision: Do we go home? Do we or not? Um, and then the next question: Can I go home if I wanted to? Is my airline operating? Are the mm-hmm. airports open? Are the, the borders? That sort of thing. So there's, there's all of that. And then, of course, if I get if I was, this is all sort of what if thinking, which is not always the best way to think about things. But at the same time, you want to be prepared too. So. If um, I did get sick, I'd be going on my own with my limited Spanish and I'd have to figure it out. Right. So, you know, that's something else that you go, right, because you just you do the best you can and that's it. Um, you also don't have the, the same level of connections and, and local support networks that you would have in your home country as well. So we're kind of you're reliant on your own um resources really ecosystem Um, so for example with the babysitting we 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 didn't have like a whole heap of friends and family members that we could ask for assistance with babysitting so you you pay for someone which is fine but you know there's just all these extra considerations as a foreigner you have to kind of think about now now, we speak the the language fluently even though i speak the language fluently i'm not seen as a local i'm seen as a gringo i mean I, I've lived 48 years of my life, no, 49 years of my life outside of Spain. Mm-hmm. I wasn't even born here. So, uh, yes, I, I speak it fluently, but they get surprised every time I speak it because, <laughs> because I don't match their reality. They speak, they're not. And, and, and what I've noticed is that even, even the social nuances, uh, what you're expected to do, we we are in the dark. We don't know when we should be kissing, when we shouldn't be kissing, when we a hug is required, when the distance is required. Uh, it's very confusing sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> even at, at their shop, at the local supermarket, something as simple as following the signs. You don't. You look for the signs that you're used to. Right. You, you look for those signs, and now. And you're standing in the line and all of a sudden you get in trouble because you're in the line for only 10 <laughs> articles. You got told off. <laughs> instead of the full basket that I had, I probably had one more. But um, but there was surely yeah, somebody in line that, behind you who probably, counted it for you and said, oh, senor. <laughs> probably, yeah, it was a girl. <laughs> there she did. She was quite upset. Said, Sorry, I didn't see the sign, but it's just there. Oh, yeah, I was looking for a different type of sign. Um, so there's those kind of cultural changes that you put somebody out of there. I think, and then, um, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily win you friends all the time. <laughs> yeah. Now, where you're staying now, is that a hotel? Is that your own place? Is that an Airbnb? How, what are your accommodations while you're in Spain? We're actually renting, We're renting. Yeah. a place um, for a short stay until the 31st of May. And then the idea was to, to leave Madrid because it gets very hot. I'm not sure whether the lockdown will be over by then, so we'll right. we'll have to revisit that. Mm. So, uh, so you're you're you're. But yeah. where one of the go yeah, on. go ahead go ahead. I was just going to say one of the things that we were commenting on, you know, just chatting between us, is that because we we both actually moved around and travelled a lot growing up, and so we're quite good at being able to pick up and move and and I guess have that ability to change fairly quickly. So that's um, proving very helpful right now when we say, well, we don't know where we're going to be in a couple of months time. We don't know. We'll be here, there or somewhere else entirely. Um, And yeah, it's just kind of interesting. I think that these little sort of micro skills that, that you learn. But being in the place that you are right now, you did not anticipate staying that long or did you? We, we would have still been here. Okay. Um, there is a bit of a shame because, yeah, like you said, part of it is we wanted to be here and experience the, the life here. Um, so it's like, oh, well, we've been inside these walls for a little while, you know. Mm. Um, and then if we, if we move on, we've kind of missed out of, on the lifestyle aspect right. that, that we enjoy here. Now... 
how are you experienced? I don't know if, if, if you actually have any insight into that aside from watching the local news or if you're having uh, conversations with your neighbors from one balcony to the other. Um, what's the economic situation? Are, are people, I mean, I'm, I woke up to the news here in the United States that in the last week, um, 6.5 million Americans filed for unemployment, that it's double the amount of new unemployment filings of l the week before. So just within the last two weeks, mm -hmm. 10 point something million Americans are without a job. And I'm assuming it is very similar in countries like Spain, like Italy, um, the, the, the big, let's say, corona hotspots in Europe, that this is affecting the economic situation, the daily, well, the, the, the income situation of many around you. Is that something mm -hmm. you, you have a, a pulse read on? Is that yes. something you have an idea on? Yeah, I do. I do. I, my, one of my cousins here, he is setting up his own business. And he was just taking off, and unfortunately, his main client is in Italy, <laughs> not mm -hmm. in Italy. So that's that's killed the whole deal. Um, so he's unemployed. Um, his partner is still employed because he's with a large national, but they don't know what the the future holds. It all depends how long this lockdown continues mm -hmm. for, because it's it's gotten tougher. Um, this week they've uh, they've tightened it even more. So, uh, another one of my cousins, both, uh, one is working from home, uh, but he is in manual labor. So he's being given an ERTE, he's called E-R-T-E, which basically a lot of people here in Madrid are getting, which means you are fired for the time that the lockdown exists, but as soon as the lockdown is over, you're re re-employed. Right. So in the meantime, you go on unemployment benefit. Right. So a lot, a lot of people are in that spot. Those are the lucky ones, really, because the unlucky ones are the self-employed, like the taxi drivers that I, I was talking to this morning. Um, nothing has happened towards the, his expenses. The expenses are exactly the same, but uh, taxi drivers now can only drive depending on, on evens and odd number days. So um, they can't drive all the time, they can't work all the time, and when they do work, there is no people using taxis. So mm -hmm. if they're lucky, they will see five clients the whole day. Um, wow. So those people are okay for now. Um, but remember, it's week two. And I can see that they're worried because um, the government has... In, in Australia, You're losing track of time. It's week three. Yeah. <laughs> the days are blending into each other. Yeah. Three, but it's very early of week three. Yeah. So I think people have, may have a little bit of reserve, but yeah. Yeah. And I have noticed, though, because I've been looking you know, at international news a little bit, and I don't see much on the news here about the economic situation. Mm. I mean, I know there's been a lot of discussion in Australia and in the US about that, but I... I feel like most of the news here is, is about the health, about the hospitals, about it's the health angle. And, you know, I'm not hearing anything about stimulus packages or anything like that, where, you know, there's a lot of that going on in Australia. And I, I know, I don't know so much yes. for the US, but yeah, yeah, very much you know, so, yeah. it's, it's just the focus is very different. Mm -hmm. And I wonder as well, because I mean, Spain was obviously hit quite hard by the, the financial crisis, whereas, um, I, I'm, I'm comparing to Australia being, being where I'm from. We were, had a kind of a, a lucky escape. We didn't fare too badly compared to many other countries through mm. that. So it's, there's a very different kind of economic yeah. situation. And, then, yeah. and also the, the health impact is huge. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th this is something as a European, which is, is quite concerning to me. Um, I'm, I'm of a generation um, born and raised in Germany, where, where the European idea to me is paramount mm -hmm. to peace and prosperity for the continent. So I know that younger generations may have different views on that, but I grew up in, in a Germany that was then still divided. And I understand that the European Union is the, the bedrock of, of, of peace and prosperity for people in Europe. So the, the economic crisis that hit especially the Mediterranean members of the EU, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, um, is now basically a, a, a double whammy. We're, we're, I mean, I, I don't want to get too philosophical, but 
if, if we're looking at the past 30, 35 years um, of world history, we had four, four systemic, now we have four sy systemic disruptions, right? We had the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. We had 9-11. We had um, the economic crisis, stock market crisis in 2008-9, and now we have coronavirus. So th those are four, I would say, major mm. blows to to the balance of, of the world as we know it. And, mm. and Spain has been hit twice really hard, right? Um, so I, I wonder how, when we come back, I'm not saying if, I'm saying when we come back from this, how will yeah. how will our togetherness look like? How will we look each other in the faces after this? How we how will we approach each other? And I wonder if 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 the change will be a positive one or one that may may be reason for for worry. Uh, I see the, the the positive sides of Europe. Uh, I've seen news coming out of Europe where one country is helicoptering ICU patients to another country and they're accepting each other's patients because mm -hmm. there is capacity across the border. While the border might be physically closed for travel, it is, it is, is not closed for the patients who are in desperate need of help. Right. So that, that's the sign of Europe mm -hmm. we need to see, right? Now, will countries like Italy and Spain Will will the rest of Europe come to their economic rescue? Will there be new stimulus packages? Will there be new debts incurred by every European nation in in order to help out those who have been hit hardest? And if so, will will the rest of Europe, the wealthier parts of Europe, um, feel a certain degree of resentment for having had to bail out somebody else again? Um, how, mm -hmm. all of these are valid questions to ask and none of us have a crystal ball how this will, will play out. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just concerned for, for our, our social togetherness. Um, and, and yeah, I know I, I went on a, on a tangent. This, 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 uh, <laughs> uh, Christian, it's not um, a, a weird tangent. I think it's a very valid one from a psychological perspective, which is what we specialize in. What we have seen is the closing of borders, um, you know, to avoid the spread of the virus, which makes sense, um, you know, but traditionally, uh, borders have existed to keep people out. And you know, so all of a sudden, we are um, giving validity to the, to the idea of Madrid has a border, and we're going to keep the people in Madrid inside so they don't spread the infection out. And now Spain has a border. So all of a sudden, something that, that we fought so hard to demolish, this idea that we're separate countries, that, that we won Europe mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a matter of, of a couple of weeks has completely changed. And, and, um, and people are very much very aware of their territories, again, uh, even to the small level as a city, um, mm -hmm. even, even, to, to, even within cities where the pockets of, of uh, infection there are, right. or contagion. Uh, so it's quite interesting what you're talking about, because from a psychological level, I think this is, this is going to be interesting to see whether people will go back to this idea that all of a sudden we're one Europe again, mm. uh, when we weren't, when we needed it. Um, because I have, that's a beautiful story that you've just told, you know, one country helping the other and it unified Europe, you would expect that to be so. Um, however, I'm not seeing that here within Spain itself. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had some political unrest with uh, Catalonia, Cat mm -hmm. I think Catalonia in English, um, so that, that's still causing tension. Right. And I think probably that's one of the reasons why this coronavirus may have hit us hardest is because we have been so politically distra distracted. Mm. Uh, leaders here in Madrid, Madrid, you know, they, they had one of the strangest elections in history where they had no president for I don't know how long because yes. of the whole political maneuvering, which was right at the time when we arrived, which was right at the time when I noticed the happenings in Wuhan developing. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. and so and and so everybody was distracted instead of paying attention to what was right. happening elsewhere in the world. Plus, and there was a the story with with uh, so unprepared. There, there was also the story that I, I followed only a little bit, but the 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 king disowning or, or separating himself from yeah. from from his father Juan Carlos uh, because he had some yes. unsavory th business things going on. So the the son said, "Nope, I'm not having any of this." So in order to save the monarchy, basically, so a lot of a lot of distraction yeah. going on, right? Mm -hmm. And and um, I mean, uh, if you understand what that means, the, the Juan Carlos, the father, the the old king, uh, was not a hated figure in Spain. Was was one of those few monarchs that was actually quite loved by the people. Well, he and reunited the, for this to happen. He re reunited the country after the the, the dictatorship, and he he basically made a a democratic Spain the way we know it now possible because he yes. He, uh, After after the whole craziness, he he was the the anchor of stability, right? Yeah, he did a wonderful job. So he was loved by the people, right. and uh, for for this to happen, and the people turn against him like they have, um, it, it's also something that in the collective psyche um, of of Spain, it's it's a heavy burden to bear, right. and right. Um, so there's there's a little bit of unrest from that, and now to get the coronavirus. And you have to strengthen the borders, not just the ideological borders, which are bad enough, but also the physical borders. It'll be interesting to see. Now, in, in coming back to the the topic that we started out with, the how <laughs> the, the the article that I, I I wrote for your EMAG about how different regions in the world are responding to this crisis, and it from what we know now, it appears that those cultures that we the people from liberal democratic societies from the so-called western world um, uh, systems mm -hmm. that we don't like very much because they're totalitarian they're controlling they are um, regulating and, and intruding people's lives societies like that seem to be most successful in handling the crisis look at korea look at taiwan look at singapore japan and china where um mm -hmm the control of people, the monitoring of people seems to yield, uh, from what we know now, I'm, I'm no prophet here, but from what we know now, mm -hmm. they, they seem to have been most successful in curtailing the, the or the flattening the curve, so to say. Now, this comes at a high price, right? And, and, and societies like Germany, Spain, Italy, France, that are looking at these models and they're saying, okay, do we need to have, do we need, instead of physical borders, do we need mind space borders? Do we need technological borders? Do we need to monitor our people and control our people in a different way? Are we as a Western society willing to give up these hard fought for individual personal liberties in order to stay healthy and alive? Can I, can I, from, from my psychological background, I guess, one of the things we talk about, and this is, I'm going to come at it from a very different angle, but right. one of the things we talk about in mental health services for people with severe mental health issues who, you know, we have these um, situations where sometimes people might be at risk, usually of, of hurting themselves if they get to a very dark space. And we have laws that say if that's the situation that comes about as a society, we can put people in hospital, for example, for their, their own well-being, for their own safety. Um, and uh, generally it's called having someone scheduled. And we have this concept that's called uh, dignity of risk. And it says that as, as all sort of human beings, we have, by virtue of being human, we have the right to take risks um, in our own lives. So for example, if I want to smoke cigarettes and I know that that can do physical harm to my body, but I have the right to take that risk with my life. Um, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But there are certain situations where we, we as a society step in and take over. And there's this whole um, challenge that often happens in mental health services saying, well, where's that line? And, um, And, and how do you decide when the risk is so bad that you're going to step in and take charge and, and be um, paternalistic in your approach um, for, the, for the best outcome, so to speak? 
So this is kind of a conversation that that we have in mental health services and, and where we have found the best results come from are by starting from a place that people have that right to choose for themselves and then the worst case scenario we step in as opposed to starting with worst case having a top-down sort of approach and then occasionally giving people some freedoms. So I'm sort of viewing everything that's going on from this sort of lens of my background in mental health training around the individual's right to choice and dignity right. of risk. And if I want to risk, you know, um, going out and getting, um, getting sick, then that's, that's my risk. And, um, but how does that fit in with the health and safety of everybody else and what's their right to be safe in the world as well? And, then you can argue, well, they have their right to take their risk. And, and it's this whole sort of debate that I'm seeing replayed in a completely different mm -hmm. way around, around coronavirus. And, you know, it's, it's like the cultural aspects to that's really interesting as well. Um, what you saying? A little bit uh, scary, Christian, is the willingness, the willingness that there is in the world at the moment to take away people's freedoms in the name of a better value, better mm -hmm. um, doctor value. And that is of concern um, mm -hmm. because yes, I could get very good results living someone else's life according to my values, but is that the right thing for that person, both psychologically, emotionally, ethically, and morally? Um, that's a, a very different question. Um, you know, do we want a government that is paternalistic? Do we want a health system that tells you exactly what to do with your body because it's the right thing for you? Mm -hmm. Do we do we have have we lost the right to make decisions over our minds and our bodies? And um, I, I think, you know, what has made Western society uh, one of, in my view, one of the best societies in the world is our respect for other people's opinions our respect mm. for other people's ways of life. Mm. And um, when you get elements that, that um, contrive or construct a narrative uh, in order to take away people's freedoms, then we're in a very dangerous, slippery slope. Right. I mean, what is the difference between communist China and democratic Spain if the actions are absolutely the same? Right. Dif difficult, difficult right. conversations, difficult, as you said, slippery Very slope. Difficult. And, and, and where do we draw the line? I'm, I have, I have not the answer. Yeah. And I, um, I am, no. I, I think the main concern for all of us is should be to, to do what's within our individual power, so to say, in within our reach to, um, stop the spread. And, and, and if, it, yeah, and, and as a second, I guess one of the things that troubles me, I'm going. No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. I'm one good. of the things that troubles me, though, in the past few weeks is seeing the levels of conflict that these kinds of challenges have brought between friends, family members, you know, people, you know, everyone's got their own view and their own opinion on these things, and they're, you know, very passionate about that many times. And I just, I think that's such a shame to see in times of stress we really want people to be able to support each other and come together rather than right. you know attack each other for having different perspectives or different views on it right i'd like to right. see you know a healthy discourse about it without you know attacking each other because that just adds a whole it's difficult enough right now let alone to be having fights with people about our views and and our opinions yeah and um, I'm, I'm monitoring our, our Facebook pages while we're talking because there are a few comments coming in. So those of you who are watching, um, feel free to post a question or a comment in the comment section. We're streaming live on the Culture Guy and the Culture Mastery. Either one would work. And we have a fellow Aussie here commenting um, <laughs> from Sydney to boot. So there you go, guys. Um, so... Brett from Sydney, who Hello. now who, who now lives in Chicago, he made a few comments. I guess when I said Aussie, 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 he said oi, oi, oi. That would be the proper response, I guess. <laughs> um, and then there's a comment. I have no idea what that means. Four and twenties. Do you know what that means? I think it's referring <laughs> to stuff that you guys are missing. I do. 
What what are four I and twenty? I am using them. Pies, <laughs> me pies, four and twenties. Well, what's four and twenty stand for? I have no idea. It's a brand. It's a brand of a pie. It's a brand. I have no idea where it comes from. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why four and twenties. But that's what they call it. <laughs> here so in the yeah, US, that's the culture. It's definitely miss. Here in the US, 420 refers to a date in April. It also refers to friends of a certain substance. Um, so that might be, ah. if, if you get my drift. If not, then I will explain I it. I didn't know time. that. <laughs> no, 420 four, four is the, is the, um, the quote unquote holiday of of dope heads who who need their their spliff so i don't know how how that came about but 420 is is that um so if anyone has any questions feel free to weigh in i'm, I'm trying to read them yeah. as fast as i can while i'm refreshing the page so guys you got to keep in mind i live in the united states where we have awesome internet but it doesn't mean that it works awesomely during these times when everybody is hogging bandwidth. I got two teenagers being yeah. homeschooled right now, so they're using the the web as well. So we're 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 making do with what we have, right? Um, how 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 do you keep your little one? How how old is Lucas? He's what elementary school age or six? Okay, so six. How, He's just started. Yeah. How are you keeping him entertained? Uh, with great difficulty. <laughs> um, he's easy to entertain with the iPad right now. He is on the iPad and he loves Netflix, so he chooses his cartoons, and that can that can entertain him for long enough for us to to do things like this. Oh. And I'm all right with that because he's doing it in another language, so it's kind of like language class. Nice. He's doing it in nice. English in Spanish, so he yes. comes out knowing yeah. a lot of words and asking, what's this, what's that? Yeah. Oh, but we're good. making but we sure have, we have to, to monitor it though. We do have a bit of a routine though that we've established in quarantine each day, don't we? So, yeah. so we're up quite quite early in the morning so that we can get the right time zone where we need to you know, call different places in the world. So, so we're up and we get a few hours work in before he even gets up. Um, and then uh, we'll, I'll do, you know, a little bit of maths with him. And then we'll, later on, we'll go back to some work and he'll have some free play time. And then we'll do a little bit of some reading and some writing together. I've got some books. So, you know, he's at that stage where he's just learning to read and learning to write mm -hmm. and putting it all together. You know, I've done the research and found different online applications to do different games. We have nice. we've around 3.30 in the afternoon, we, we go up we, to the stairs and we go up and down. This day, so we bring him with us for the first two goes, and then after two goes, he goes, "Okay, I'm done." So uh -huh. we bring him in. And he does he, all right. That's yeah. ten flights. He does all right. Yes. Good. He usually says he doesn't want to come, but we make him to come because he needs the exercise. He needs to burn off that energy. He needs so. to burn it. So it helps. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw somebody post um, something yesterday on social media, and they said, um, "If if your brain is foggy, or if you feel like in this current situation you're 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 in a in a weird mental space." then that means your body is not getting enough motion so do something do jumping jacks do yeah. push-ups or if you're allowed to just yeah. run around the block or do whatever it takes get some as we yeah. say in nlp one modality if you change one modality you change all the others with them so if you if you change your mm -hmm. physical state your your mental state will follow because only a body in motion Absolutely um stays yeah. in motion um Absolutely. and the other thing is don't be afraid of pain seek a little bit of pain in exercise right you want to stretch no yourself right i mean no 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 ridiculous pain, amount of pain but you know no pain no gain that idea right. and it right. really means that don't, not mm. not just oh my god i have to move but move to the point of oh i couldn't do another one that's <laughs> that's it right um, that's a good thing keep stretching yourself that that provides the body a, a break it, it also has got a very good mental health effect it yeah. provides your your body a way of stepping out of your problems right if you're feeling pain in the body that occupies your attention exactly <laughs> so that's actually good for you mentally yeah, yeah. 
And then no, the other thing is, it. I mean, diet as well is so, it's so yeah. easy when you're stuck in the house to just go to your, your comfort foods and all of that. But it's, mm. it's more critical now than ever to be, you know, just doing those basics, diet, exercise, sleep. I mean, we all know it. So doing them and at the same time being kind to yourself and saying, well, you know, these, these are difficult times. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have right. to, you know, come out of this and an Olympic athlete. I don't have to come out with all of the projects that I had set for myself done. So it's just getting that balance. I and think. even if Keeping you busy go, is good, it keeps you moving. Yeah. And, and even if your goal was to come out as an Olympic athlete, you have another year to prepare because the Olympics have been postponed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to find, find the, the light in this. So Brett from Sydney had another comment around our, our philosophical debate of a minute ago. He said, there's a great podcast from Australia called The Philosopher's Zone, which has often discussed this topic of um, mm -hmm. what political and social movements would be acceptable for societies and, and what societies would make of them. And, and Tanja Ulbrich, I'm assuming German, well, the name looks German, says a good question to ask is where do your right to choose overlap other people's rights? Um, right. So he yeah. health is a human right and we are all interdependent in the situation. So where does your own freedom of, or what did you say, dignity of... Dignity of risk. What is your own dignity of yeah. risk overlap somebody else's dignity, right? So yeah, yeah. Right. And in health services, the principle is do no harm to others. Right. Right. Um, you know. So. So you do. You do have to. It, it's a fine balance, but uh, you can't let one good argument overshadow all the others necessarily. So you need to hold both in place. My dignity of risk and uh, your, your right to be protected. Exactly. Um, but I can't create a story in order to manipulate you that will trump your right to, to risk. Um, for example, I can't say every time I watch somebody bungee jump, I get, I get a panic attack. Therefore, all bungee jumping should be stopped. Mm. Um, well, that's very self-serving. You know, why, what about if I just don't watch it? Um, <laughs> you know, That, that would be the end. Uh, so I also have to take responsibility. Right. Um, now, it's a little bit different with, with a virus, and this is the interesting thing. Um, this is what makes it difficult because we're talking about something we can't see, we don't know, uh, we don't, we're not even sure how it is being transmitted. There's a few ideas going around. Um, so, so we do have to, I believe that we do have to be respectful of other people. I mean, when I go out, I, I wear a mask. And I wear it not because I'm afraid of getting it. I'm, I'm more like thinking, well, what happens if I'm one of those asymptomatic people and I'm spreading it? And I don't know it because I'm asympt right. asymptomatic. Yeah, so because it takes, what, 10 days until... Being considerate. Yeah. yeah, well, we're talking about 15 days in some cases longer. So, yeah. In a really practical level, I, I've been out once and I went to the supermarket and it was really interesting. Some people wearing masks, some not, some wearing gloves, some not some wanting heaps of space between people, some not seeming to care so much. It actually made it really hard because I'm trying to be respectful of who wants space and it like shopping became way more complicated. Oh, uh, well, it started. You, you came for a culture. Difference. Okay, show us, so show us what's happening. Now. So we're gonna check you outside <laughs> uh, so you can see what's happening. Oh, I'm, I'm curious to see that. Oh, wow. Yeah, all right, It's already started. The dog is complaining upstairs. <laughs> so it, explain to us what's happening. So people are out on their balconies and they're... So the people are coming out on the balcony. They're clapping. They're playing a very traditional yep. Spanish song. I don't know if it's the anthem. I don't think it's no, the it's anthem, the but anthem. it's a very traditional song. They're all clapping. All around. And they're clapping in support of the medical staff, doctors and nurses who are... I think it started being yeah. in support of the medical. Yeah, they're including police. They're including um, the shopkeepers. They're also risking themselves for us. And I think they're also they're clapping because it's fun and they want to be connected. Right. 
This is lovely. This is lovely. It, it, this is yeah. how this is how this we is maintain right community. Now all around Spain. Oh wow! And this is how we make sense of things. Yeah. All around Spain. So whenever you look in Spain, people are doing this. It's very beautiful. Emotional. Yeah. There Let us know if you want us to stay out or go in. No, no. This is this is beautiful. This is in fact emotional. Yeah. So it's a it's a very interesting phenomenon. Every single day, eight o'clock. Showing respect. This is you seeing us. You're just showing me. <laughs> no, it, me. The, 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 this is perfectly all right, and it also is a. It, it is a way for us as we're human beings we, we don't want to be isolated from each other we need the connection and the, the term social distancing is so misleading because we are still being social with each other and this is this is one way to express our our togetherness i know they can see down there i'm not sure Thank where i'm pointing the camera <laughs> The interesting thing, five minutes ago, you would have looked out here and you would have looked like there was nobody home. And now everybody's out. Now you see everybody's alive and hiding in that. It's, uh, it's very practical. It is. I'm going to let you enjoy this moment. Um, <laughs> Peter, thank you. Emmy, thank you for sharing this with us, sh sharing this with me. This, this is good. This is good. Yeah. It's well, Are you getting much. a little bit emotional, Christian? I am. Yeah. Yeah. I did the first night in particular. I did too. It was like, oh wow, everyone came out. Now it's kind of it's got a celebration in a way. It's like everyone's supporting each other. Good job, guys. Keep it up. Yes. You know. I speak and, do you? Yeah. 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 So it's very nice. And then and then it finishes and everyone goes back inside and that's it. It's like see you, see you tomorrow, hasta mañana, and uh yeah, then then that's well, it. It's one song. It'll continue as long as we stay here. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> this is awesome. Um you try this in Germany and people will um, I'm, I'm being super, super stereotypical here, but in, I've seen videos, spoof videos, where people try this in Germany, and they're threatening each other with sending the police for violating public order and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> here in the US, we're not quite as far, and I'm, I'm not sure if, if US society would be open to doing this this way. Um, but this is how one country deals with its mess. Yeah. Um, yes. how, yeah. how, as, as you said, Peter, how, how we're, we give meaning to what's going on. Um, thank you mm -hmm. for, for being on here with me for, for an hour. Thank you for watching, everybody. Yes, um, if you feel like you want to comment or ask questions, keep doing so. Um, Peter and I, and, and Emmy, Peter, Emmy and I will, will answer them accordingly. Um, sure feel free to follow their Facebook in order to find wherever else on the web they are. Um, there might be more collaborations coming. Um, Peter, Emmy, and my wife and I, we're already talking about how we might be able to collaborate in the future. And I'm very much looking forward to having that conversation with you guys because we work in similar fields that are adjacent to each other. So um, you guys, please stay healthy. Um, Take care okay. of yourselves and and thank you for being on. Talk soon. Bye. Bye everybody.